Hi there and welcome to another self-teach module. In this module we're going to focus on resilience and in particular an aspect of resilience which is about understanding negative stress and strain and then how we can manage it. Both manage it personally and also support that process within our team and the individuals in our team. I'm Dave Aldrew, your session facilitator, so let's get stuck in. So what to expect? As always with these modules, there'll be some models, tools and tips. There'll be some reflective questions, which I do encourage you to do because they'll help embed the learning and consider how you'll apply them in the context of your life and your role as a leader. And there'll be some post session resources and exercises. So what I want you to do or consider with it, how you use this module is firstly to give yourself plenty of time. Plenty of time to not only watch the video, but to pause it where necessary, to do the exercises, to digest things and to allow yourself to, to embed the learning. Download the PDF workbook. Now you can do that afterwards, or as I would recommend you do that now, if you haven't already, and have it alongside the video so that you can find the exercises that I encourage you to do the reflections on in the workbook, or you can just scrap a paper if you wish, but it, it's nice sometimes to keep it in the workbook itself. Complete the exercises, do encourage you to do that, and feel free to pause and rewind at any time. There are one or two post session activities which you'll find that I don't refer to in this video. So feel free to go back through the workbook and find those and consider attending the um, drop in Q&A sessions. Now, some of those may be online, some of those may be in person. Uh, there's no dates planned at time of recording, but the plan is to have those. And the aim of those is to allow you to expand your knowledge, deep, dig deeper into issues where you might have a particular question about one aspect or several aspects of the topic in question. So let's get on with what we need to cover. Okay, so we're going to cover understanding stress and strain. I prefer the word strain to stress because I don't know about you. I think that word stress is a much used and overused word that becomes meaningless over time and depending on the context it's used. So I prefer strain and we'll expand on that in, later in the session. We're going to look at how to spot the warning signs, which is really important when we're talking about actually doing something about stress or struggling to cope. How do we know when we're struggling to cope? Or how do we know when a member of our team is struggling to cope? We're going to look at a model called the Roffey Park um, Resilience Indicator, which is a really useful model to capture some key elements of resilience. When you look across the literature um, in, of resilience, there are no, uh, numerous dimensions that we can explore here. But as a teacher and as somebody trying to absorb and learn what is practical and usable, we need to boil it down to some key elements and the Roffey Park model helps us do that. So we will tease that out through the remainder of the session, looking at how to cope with overwhelm, that momentary sense of steam coming out your ears about press send on an email or a text you should never press send on that kind of feeling and also how to invest in our own self-care because that's often the first thing to go out the window when we're under stress or strain and it's about how do we do it for ourselves and also encourage team members to do that in an appropriate and healthy way and then dealing with overload the underlying problem of managing the demands we'll explore that as well so this is a very practical session in one sense that it is something you can take a lot of tools away for you personally and hopefully you can also encourage team members to uh, engage in and feel free to share some of the resources and tips that you get within this video and the, the workbook with your team members. Okay, so first let's just take some a, a, a pause here. Um, it's a 60 second timeout. However, you are feel free, you know, feel free to just pause the video for longer if you want to just capture your thoughts. Uh, over the longer term and you can also do this as a, a thought process over the coming days as well and revisit this exercise but what I want you to do is just kind of identify what do you find stressful we'll get into this stress strain thing in a moment but what do you find stressful what do you struggle to cope with and have a think about that from the perspective of your team and the individuals in there what are they what do you feel they struggle with and this is where perhaps you, it might be easier to identify it in yourself, but it may take some conversations and some interaction with your team uh, at a future point to identify their stresses. So this exercise is useful to do on that basis later as well. So we'll pause the video and give you 60 seconds. Feel free to... Uh, so we'll give you 60 seconds. Feel free to pause the video if you wish, and we'll take it from there.
So no doubt there are a few things in there and what I want to do is give you a video to illustrate why these things cause problems. But one of the things I do want to stress straight away is that you have permission to be human. Now I particularly love this phrase because I heard it once when I heard the author of the book Happier, uh, Tal Ben-Shahar, mention it um, when he was doing a book tour across in Newcastle several years ago now. And the phrase struck me because I think many of us forget that we are human beings. We're physical, emotional and psychological creatures. And as such, we can forget to pay attention to the needs of that physical, psychological and emotional creature. And in the process, we kind of adopt the rules and we drive ourselves to be all things to everybody in all capacities and forget that this human being is vulnerable, has some wonderful qualities, but also has some very basic, simple needs. Simple, not necessarily easy. We'll come back to that. So give yourself permission to be human. Okay. So what I want to do now is take a step out and I'm going to play a short video for you. Because I'm not with you in person, I can't demonstrate the metaphor that I use for this session physically and in person. I would normally involve people in this process, but because we're doing this online, um, what I need to do is create uh, give you a little video. Uh, it involves my little daughter, Rosie, who helped me film this. It's only three minutes long. It might seem a little bit fun in one sense, but there are some serious points being made. So it's about the metaphor I like to use, and then we'll tease out the rest of the session to help you understand why we get bogged down. Why does our head feel battered by the stresses and strains of life and our rules and, and the juggling that we have within life? So watch the video and we'll take it from there. Let's look at how we get bogged down with stress. I'm going to use a metaphor inspired by a TV program from my childhood, Cracker Jack. Now firstly, let's meet my little daughter Rosie. Isn't she cute? We're going to give Rosie a bunch of toys, and she's happy about that. But these toys represent something to us. They're the positive demands in life. You know, the stuff that takes effort, motivation and energy, but we associate them positively. And that's an important thing to remember. The good stuff, because it takes energy and effort, can add to the cumulative impact of the demands in our life. And we'll see how that plays out now. So what positives do you have in your life? Here's some examples and we'll give the cuddly toys and the toys to Rosie. Holiday, family time, a night out with friends, some me time. Now look, Rosie's happy, isn't she? We do, however, need to consider the negative demands, don't we? And that's typically the stuff we would say stresses out or overwhelm us, or we have to do in order to get some of the other positives. I'm sure you can think of one or two, can't you? These negative demands are represented by the cabbages. And here's some examples. Workload, feeling out of control, a bullying relationship, those essays that are leading to that qualification, email, change and uncertainty, not enough time, feeling tired. Rosie doesn't appear so pleased about this now, does she? There is, however, one more cabbage, and it's the smelliest cabbage of them all. Or as I lovingly call it, the smelly cabbage of self-sabotage. It's that inner voice that always seems to criticise you, find fault, add in a good dollop of guilt, and remind you of who are you to think you could, or point out why bother it always goes wrong for you. Yep, that's the voice of self-cabotage, and it can be crippling. We have enough to cope with, don't we, in terms of managing and juggling the cabbages. And what do we do at a time like that? Well, we often allow that voice of self cabotage to get louder and to start to convince you how much worse things are, how never-ending they seem to be, and how rubbish you are at coping, and in fact, how, how it's all your fault anyway. It's ironic, isn't it, that when we most need a positive inner voice, we find that negative voice kicks in and makes coping so much harder. Add that to the pile, and it's going to turn the rest of the cabbages rotten, isn't it? In other words, we cope less well, and our coping ability deteriorates quite dramatically. And now, as we can see, Rosie is overloaded. Have you experienced that? Can you relate? The questions that are worth reflecting on, and we'll do so in the session, are How sustainable is this for you? If this were you carrying all those cabbages around? Where is your focus likely to be? Is it calm and composed or overwhelmed and irritable? And the killer question, what has happened to the toys? They've been crushed, you can't see them. And this, friends, is where it gets tricky because the toys, those positive demands, turn out not to be a luxury after all. They are, in fact, essential 
to your well-being over the long term. Taking time for social connection, me time, exercise, chill time, all those things are essential for your longer term ability to cope. So, back to the main session and we'll discuss your observations. Thanks Rosie, we'll see you later in the session. Okay, so hopefully that video resonated with you. You'll see as we go through, we'll tease out some of the key metaphors as we go forward. But what I want to do is kind of just give you the, the key model that I like to work with when I'm talking about strain. As I said before, I'm not particularly a fan of the word stress. Not because stress itself doesn't exist, because it does and it's real, but it's the understanding and the way that people have used the word over time. I mean, how many times have you heard the word used in that casual, oh, I'm stressed. And it's a kind of a casual word that becomes meaningless. Or people are stressed, but don't say anything because there's a stigma around it. You know, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. You're weak if you're stressed. All of that is rubbish. However, there's a lot of those associations with it. And what I want to do is step away from the word stress and think about strain. Because there's less baggage around that word. But if you think about it, there's physical strain. If you've ever been to the gym or gone for a strenuous run or walk or something, you will have felt physically strained. And that is really, really valuable because our body needs to be physically strained in order to grow and, and to, to thrive. However, as no doubt you know, we can overdo it, can't we? We can train too much. We can forget to rest. We can forget to eat right to support the training that we do. We can overdo it. And that is the same for psychological stress and strain. Because, you know, we need challenge. We need stimulus. We need something, adversity to an extent, to help us thrive, to, to help us motivate us to, to meet the challenges, to, to be on our, our A game, if you like. However, just like physical strain, we can overdo it. It can be on far too acutely in the moment. You know, you might have a particularly stressful experience or event in the moment that is just crushing, or you may find that over time, the, the weight of those cabbages, the demands, just bog you down over time, and you can find that it, it's overdone. So I think it's really important to acknowledge that this <clears throat> is a very human thing, but when we talk about run stress, we talk about strain, then perhaps we can take away that baggage. And on this note, what I want to do is also give you just a permission, if you like, to recognise that sometimes when we're talking about this particular topic, and you're thinking about it from yourself, you may encounter someone, some surfacing of emotions and feelings that perhaps you pushed away or bottled down because of past experience or other things that you're going through now. What I want to do is just say, whatever you feel is right for you in terms of your own safety and your own well-being, please do that. If you need to speak to somebody, please do that. Throughout this, it's all about seeking the right support. And as a leader, if you could experience that and acknowledge that yourself, you know that there, are, there will be people within your team who experience this as well. And then that can help support you become a better leader for, in supporting them. But do what's right for you. Don't go it alone, don't isolate, get that support. Because what we're talking about when we're talking about strain here is a combination of things. It's a combination of the high demands, the demands of life, of the roles that you do, of the external demands that we have placed on us, whether it's a, a work, you know, um, study deadline, that kind of thing, or within your leadership role, within your association or club, some of the demands that are placed on you there. There's also the internal demands the things that we place on ourselves within here. So what we're talking about in here is things that like might be your perfectionism, if you're prone to perfectionism, um, your negative inner narrative, that self cabotage which we talked about in the video. That voice that's always saying, you're not good enough, or you should be, things should be, they should be, um, and all of that kind of thing. All the, the, the guilt and the emotions that come with that, they can be crushing as well, but they're additional demands that we place on ourselves. So we need to recognize them, and permission be here would be a lot more compassionate to ourselves in relation to the stuff we do in here, but we'll we'll tease that out as well as we go forward. There's also the big stuff, you know, the big events, the big things in life, but also the little things, because sometimes it's the little things, isn't it, that can uh, tip you over the edge, tip you into overwhelm, and make you feel like, oh, I'm not coping here. And we'll we'll get into that as we go forward. Second ingredient is low control. So many of you can probably handle a fair workload a high demand however when that demand gets too high we can often feel as if we're we're unable to cope with it or we have a high demand but then something changes we're unable to plan we don't feel as if we can cope with certain things in that 
the 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 goalposts change for want of a better metaphor the um the landscape that we're coping in changes and we feel like we have less control over some or all of those demands when our sense of control diminishes we feel strain we feel that psychological strain and that's when we can start to feel the negative aspects of strain a critical third element is low social support and this is something that all human beings need some of us are more introvert and extrovert fair enough there are different social needs if you like in terms of the kind of social interaction we need but we all need some interaction and that social support ranges from everything from oh, do you fancy just taking a break we'll have a cup or we'll go for a coffee or something like that through to having a walk or a talk with a loved one or a friend through to getting some professional support whether within uh, the university and the support network within your you know the student leadership academy for example or personally within your personal life, your GP, your counsellor, therapist, all of those are valid and important range, if you like, of the psychosocial mix. And we need to recognise as human beings, we haven't evolved to go it alone. We actually viscerally feel isolation and loneliness if we're placed in, in that detached state from others. And if we tend towards detaching ourselves from others when under stress, we can exacerbate that psychological strain. So this, in this three ingredients is really critical to understand. Having said that, what it also does is give us some leverage points, some points where ah, there's some opportunities here that I can tackle to reduce that psychological strain. Can I look at the demands and do something about that? Can I improve or, or challenge, uh, challenge my sense of control? Can I engage some social support, psychosocial support to help me feel as if I'm coping or supported and able to handle things? So there are lots of opportunities here as well. Okay, so let's take a time out again. No need to pause the video, but if you do feel as if you need a little bit more time, please do. What I would like you to do is to think about the video again. Jot your thoughts down. Can you relate to the video? Can you relate to that voice of self cabotage in particular? How does it affect you when under stress? Because once we start to identify how the cabbages are mounting and maybe crushing us, what they're doing to the cuddly toys, and also that voice that maybe is getting louder and more critical, we can actually start to tackle it and do something about it. And if you think about it, also think about this from the perspective of members of your team and have you experienced or seen that within uh, within your team, in particular individuals? Because I think it's important to recognise that we're all very different, we all experience the world differently and therefore experience psychological strain differently. So I'll give you a moment to focus on that. So hopefully you've got some thoughts and ideas around that and um, we will tease out some tactics as we go. Don't forget there are Q&A sessions if you feel as if you want to dive into this a little bit more, whether from a personal perspective or leading your individuals within your team. And don't forget, getting support if you are struggling is really, really important. And as a leader, it's important to demonstrate that you are willing to do that for the benefit of your team so that they know it's okay to do that. But what I want to do is move on now to tomatoes. I'm not specifically to what I'm using them as a metaphor here. The key thing to being able to do something about our stress and strain is being able to recognise when we're not coping so well. Because I don't know about you, sometimes you can be so stressed that you don't spot you're stressed or you don't notice it until you're perhaps further down the line and really struggling or you press send on that email that you shouldn't press send on or you really are feeling the strain. Ideally, the sooner we spot it, the better, because the intervention that we need will be less. So if we think about fruit or vegetables, as you can see, the image of the tomatoes on screen there, there are some signs of them going past their best. There are some outward signs. 
So in terms of the outward signs, what are those signs? In terms of the fruit or vegetables, they get wrinkly, smelly, perhaps a bit soft and squidgy to the touch. And if you think about it from a human perspective, when we struggle to cope, we're not at our best, we can often display outward signs. So have a think about that. There is an exercise coming in relation to that to get you thinking about this. But those outward signs can often be, they may not be smelly, wrinkly and squidgy, just like the tomatoes, but the equivalent. You know, somebody's appearance, they might just feel it look a bit down or, or closed off or might get a cold sore or something like that. Now, we're not saying that every sign is a sign of stress. There may be other reasons. Cold sore may just indicate a bit run down. However, there might be an indicator that things are not quite right. So that's where you might find that particularly the module on having well-being conversations useful to tap into this. And we do consider this exercise in that module as well. But here's the thing. There are inside internal signs of stress and strain. Just like you might get a, a, a baking potato, um, you put it in the microwave, 10 minutes later you get it out, you've got your beans ready to have beans on. Maybe it's just me who likes beans and jack potato. But sometimes I've cut them open, the potato, and inside there's a rotten bit. And you can't tell from the outside. Now this is the same case for many of us as human beings. Many of us have developed the ability to put on that facade like a swan, you know, gracefully gliding along the water, but underneath the, the legs won't like the clappers. I personally am a swan because I have learned, and I'm not saying this is a good thing, I've learned to mask and to keep it all in. And that leads to certain challenges. One, I'm very good at convincing the world that I'm okay and ignoring myself my own warning signs. And also because the world thinks I'm okay, they don't check in on me as much or they have to really know me or be present in the room to spot those signs and really genuinely ask, are you okay? You don't seem yourself. And that's the thing. If you've ever been asked that question, what's your stock answer? And many of you probably think, well, the response is I'm fine, I'm fine. So if you find yourself being asked that question, just pause for a moment and think, just check in. Because there's something maybe giving it away that you haven't consciously acknowledged. And if you spot that in your team, recognise that when you ask, are you okay? And they say, I'm fine. Maybe that's not the true answer. And that's again where the wellbeing conversations module will help you in terms of being genuinely interested and caring to ask a little bit more in particular ways to help you get into that in a supportive way. So what I want to do is just take another moment to um, identify some of the warning signs. And if you look in the workbook, you'll find the workbook is split into four areas, the physical, the behavioural, the emotions and the thinking. And the reason I want to split it that way is because there are the internal signs and there are the external signs. So what I want you to do is take a moment to think about what are some of the signs of you struggling to cope, both external and internal? What have you noticed within the members of your team? What do you see them displayed? And jot them down because it's really, really powerful to tune in and to almost signpost in your head. These are the things I need to look out for me. These are the things I need to look out for my team. They're not, the list is not exhaustive that I'll give you after this exercise, but you'll find that there are some common threads. So do the exercise and then I'll come back to you with some suggestions. If you need more than 60 seconds, which I suggest you might do for this, feel free to pause the video. Okay, so hopefully you've jotted a few answers down. Um, I'm going to put a few up here just to sort of illustrate and, and suggest uh, some points here for you just to uh, flesh things out a little bit. And then we'll move on to some tactics and tools. But if we look at the physical signs, as I said, we might get things like, you know, the, well, this is perhaps less visible, but a headache. You know, unless somebody's going, oh, my head's banging. 
then you're not necessarily going to know that you've got a headache. You'll know if you've got a headache, but that could be something that's internal yet physical. So there's also that dimension as well. Um, as I said, don't just assume that because somebody's got a headache, they're stressed. And don't just assume it is stress when perhaps you might need to just get it checked out by a doctor. It's always worth, if you have any doubts, getting checked out physically and psychologically if you do need that support as well. So your appearance. Sometimes when you're really struggling, even if it's pressure, pressure for time, the things that go are not only the cuddly toys, the self-care in the sense of time out for myself, go for a walk, that kind of thing, but even the basics around physical appearance, taking our taking the time that we would normally when we feel we have the luxury of time. And appearance can be a giveaway. I won't talk about having a bad hair day because I don't have hair at the moment. I haven't had hair for 12 odd years, all on the anyway, that's another subject. Not that it's touchy or anything like that. So anyway, feeling unwell, generally that feeling of just not running at optimum, just feeling ground down, perhaps capturing, catching a, a virus or a cold or just your immune system's a bit depressed and down um, in terms of activity, I mean, um, so that you're more vulnerable to that, the, 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 the bugs and viruses that are going around. It might be tension, you know, you might see it in somebody's jawline, you might see it in their, the way they're kind of always holding their shoulder. I'm, I'm not saying they're actually in a physical fight stuff, but you can sort of tell the tension there. And often a little, a little test of how much tension you're under is just to see how far your shoulders drop when you actually relax. Because that's obviously an indication of how much stress you might be under. If it's pretty high, a lot of stress. So it's also just recognising that tension could be something. In terms of behaviour, you might find somebody becomes avoidant. Um, avoiding meetings, interactions, just becoming less communicative. Um, there might be behavioural things. And I've used slamming doors as an example here, but you might find you know, people just get a little bit more aggressive or irritable, you know, stomping mugs down, hammering away at the keyboard, slamming a door, that kind of thing. Um, becoming withdrawn. So it's more, it's, it's maybe building on the avoidant in the sense that they actually withdraw from the world, withdraw from friends, close down. And that's when we can also find somebody maybe present, as in physically present, but they're not there. They're distracted. They've got other things on their mind. You can kind of see the, the, the brain is working on other things, not whatever's in front of them. And that distraction is, can be a key thing as well. In terms of the emotional, you, you may find, and this is, this is something you can spot in yourself internally, but you tend to rely on the behavioural cues of... Uh, these emotions being demonstrated out in the real world, if you like. So irritable, somebody being an irritable, you, we all have been that and probably seen that. Snappy, you know, just a bit short, uh, grumpy, that kind of thing. You might find genuine anger, people really angry and, or just either you can see them containing it, seething, or just really kind of their emotions are just boiling over. Um, tears, you know, tears are an example of just being upset. You might find that turmoil in there, the emotions just overload. And uh, coldness is the opposite. So if you imagine the tears and the anger as that emotional state, we're carrying all the cabbage, our stress level is high. It doesn't take much to tip us over into anger and emotion. Alternatively, what we may find to do, and this is where you might find the swans are more effective at it, and I'm not saying this is a good thing, shutting down and becoming cold, holding in the emotions and almost detaching ourselves from the emotional connection so that we can contain them. And again, that can be a sign of us being under incredible stress and just feeling flat and low. You know, that mood is just dropped. And one of the phenomena I find when I've worked with lots of people with, with recovering from burnout, emotional burnout, for example, is that one of the common themes that seems to come through is that their former joy in life, the colour that they see in the world, has seems to have drained out over time because of the ongoing stress and strain. And, and the world becomes monotone and becomes a bit grayscale. Um, and that feeling of feeling flat and low and just not finding joy in the things they did in the past can become common. And that's when we may slip from stress and feeling low into the milder depression into perhaps more severe, which is where support is absolutely vital. It's not about going alone or trying to fix it yourself. It's about asking for help. And that's something for you and your team to consider, the individuals in particular. You might find in cognitive terms, um, unable to focus, that's that distraction, you know, I can't focus on here because my head's all over the place, I've got too many cabbages in there and it's just, uh, they're all over the place, I can't focus, uh, I can't switch off because I'm just trying to keep the cabbage, like the cabbages are really important, I need to sort them, I need to get them sorted, but I can't, and, and your brain doesn't like that. One of the things I will always say is your brain is a rubbish cabbage storage device, and in short, what I mean is, it can't, can't handle just storing cabbages without constructively dealing with them. 
problem is your brain doesn't like to deal with cabbages under stress. It can't handle the size of them. If it has too much, I can't handle I can't deal with that, I'll put it off. And so procrastination can be a key one as well. Multitasking. Multitasking, you find things like, you know, rather than focusing on one thing, in order to give a sense of coping and control, we start to deal with lots of other things and become less effective and risk making a lot more mistakes. And then poor decision making out of that. You know, your head's not in the right place. Perhaps you're in a, unable to filter through the information you need to make that decision. And that can be a, a key sign as well. This list is by no means universal, or sorry, exhaustive. But it's just worth thinking about what are those signs. And then identifying your top three warning signs. Maybe have a conversation with each member of your team to find out what their warning signs are. And agree, you know, if you're struggling, if you're finding that this happens, come and tell me. Key thing is look for changes in behaviour where you can. I acknowledge that if you've taken over a team or you've got a new team member in and you haven't had a chance to get to know them, you've got nothing to calibrate off. So that's something to bear in mind. But it is also it is about looking for those changes. If somebody's normally bubbly and, and outgoing and suddenly becomes very quiet, that might be a telltale sign. But if they're not if you don't know them enough or they've been experiencing strain for so long that you have nothing to calibrate off, then it's worth having conversations and checking in with them. And in addition, just watch out for those swans because the swans can be really, really graceful on the top, but underneath things are going like the clappers. So again, it's not about suspecting everybody who appears to be coping to be swans, but it is about just being proactive, checking in and being present when you're with somebody for those few seconds, at, at the very least to say, how's things? and be present, absorb, use the listening skills module as a way to develop your skills in that aspect. Okay, so I'll give you a 60 second time out here to think about this. You might want to pause the video if you want for longer, but do you know anybody within your team or in life that springs to mind as we've talked about those warning signs? Because it's really important and useful to flag that and think, right, I will have a conversation with them, I'll check in with them. Check in, don't forget to do that. But just take time out to acknowledge that. And if you need to pause the video for longer to actually take the time now to check in, do it. It's fine. Come back to the video later. Okay, so the Ruffy Park Resilience Indicator. What I want to do is just talk about here um, the five elements, and then we're going to tease through some activities and exercises, and tips, tools, strategies, that kind of thing. But the Ruffy Park Resilience Capability Indicator, it's a mouthful, gives us five areas that we can focus on that can help buoy your team, help it feel like it's got some focus, some purpose, and cohes make the team more cohesive and supportive of each other. So the first area that we're looking at in terms of that is the purpose, values and strengths. And you might think, well, what, what's that got to do with well-being? But actually, there's a lot of research shows that <clears throat> as human beings, we need to feel like what we're doing is meaningful. It has meaning and it has purpose and direction. We need to feel like we're making progress towards that purpose as well. So there's nothing more frustrating than, uh, I'm going to use a, a silly example here, but I've run the, North, the Great North Run. And if you've ever done the Great North Run, running along the seafront, the finish line is there, you, know, you see it in the distance, and for so long it feels like it's not getting any closer. And that feeling is really, really disheartening. So it's important to recognise that that's a psychological thing. We need to feel like we're getting closer to the to fulfilment of the purpose. So in terms of it, the purpose is, a, is important. What's the purpose of your team? What direction are you trying? Is everybody on board with that? Are they clear? What are the values? Your personal values, the shared values of the team, can you agree and discuss those? And how do they fit in with the university's overall values as well? It's important to make sure that they, they, they complement those as well. And then what are the strengths? Because one other thing is that as human beings, 
we all possess different gifts and strengths and sometimes we can be in roles that don't play to those strengths or don't leverage or utilize them and that in itself can be quite frustrating and lead us to sort of feel less effective because we're doing stuff that perhaps we find really hard, we're not good at, we just don't enjoy doing. So it's about identifying the strengths of you and your team and, and working on those to sort of see how we can play to those strengths and leverage them because people tend to thrive when they do that. There's perspective. So we'll come back to that one as well. There's connections, your connections and your network. We talked about the importance of psychosocial support. So in terms of connections, it's really important to recognise that we don't go it alone. We don't achieve this alone. And actually the two-way support and interaction and support via our connection network, if you like, is a key part of resilience. Then physical energy. And that's around how do we look after this physical and emotional and psychological unit, this human being. And how do we take care of it in ways that maintain our physical energy? Because if we're, our physical energy is high, we're healthy, as healthy as we can be, we're well as well as we can be, then we're going to cope more effectively. Now, we all have different levels of health and fitness. It's not about being ultra fit or perfectly healthy. It's about just being the optimum that we can be in a given situation. And the final one is emotional intelligence, which I'll explore very briefly in this session because we could spend a whole session on emotional intelligence in itself but in effect it's about being aware that we're all different we all see the world differently and how we engage with each other is is about that awareness and understanding and how we manage our own emotions is also critical as well okay so purpose and values and strengths i've already explained this it's about having a direction it's about having shared values and understanding what the strengths are of our team so what i want to do is to give you an exercise Carry out the purpose, values and strengths exercise in the, in the workbook. Um, you, you will need longer than 60 seconds for this because it is one of those where you just give it a bit of thought. You may want to complete as far as you can the exercise, return to the video and then conduct this with your team as well going forward. Because it's a really useful exercise for bringing people together as well. So conduct the exercise, have a think about that and see what you can take away in terms of actions and priorities that you can in implement within your team. So hopefully you found that useful as an exercise. I want to move on to perspective. And when we're talking about perspective, we're talking about the fact that there are three areas, and I am oversimplifying perspective here, but it's really important to, to think about it in these terms. There's a short-term intermediate, sorry, immediate perspective. There's your medium-term perspective, and there's your long-term perspective. So what I mean? Well, I mentioned before that I that feeling of what, pressing send on an email you should never press send on. That's that feeling of when we're in the moment, that short term immediate perspective that can feel so true, so powerful because the emotions are backing it that we are we can be led in the short term to do things that are the wisest decision in perhaps you know the, the medium or long term. And that's important. How do we manage our emotional state in those moments where perhaps our emotions, our stress response is going to give us something to do, drive us to do something that is not rational or sensible in that moment? Permission to be human, that happens, but we need to look at that. So let's take that before we look at medium and long term. How do we deal with overwhelm in those moments? Now, one of the things that I would like you to do is just have a think about what do you do? What do you normally do under stress when in overwhelm to manage yourself constructively? What tools in the kit do you have? Feel free to pause the video if you wish now, but that can be a useful thing to think about. What I'm going to do is give you four key approaches, if you like. First one is to remove from heat. I'm using the vegetable and the cooking metaphor here, but remove yourself from the heat. The reason for that is because when under stress, it's a very primitive mechanism. It's about, it's fight or flight. You'll have heard that phrase, no doubt. But when in the presence of a threat, a challenge, our mind, our, the primitive aspects of our mind, if you like, the primitive mechanism of the stress response kicks in and, and treats it as life or death. So whilst in the presence of the threat or the challenge, even if it's an email or um, somebody expecting something from you or something you're saying to yourself, that self cabotage whilst you're in the presence of that, that response is going to remain high and can be very difficult to manage down in the presence of the stressor. Give you tactics shortly that will help with that. But wherever possible, step away. Remove yourself from the heat. Take that 30 seconds out, that five minutes out. Put the kettle on. Go for a walk. Talk to somebody. Do something that helps you just distance yourself so that you can see it differently, but also you're away from the stimulus that helps your stress response reduce. Because if you think about stress and the strain, we're in, in overwhelm, we're in high emotion, low rational. And what we're trying to do is reduce the emotion down and give our rational brain a chance to hook back in. Second one, use your physiology to help you 
bring your stress response down. It's a, it's a psychological response in terms of appraising the situation. Is this threatening or not? If it's threatening, let's activate the physical aspect of our stress response. Heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, blood goes to the key muscles of fight or flight. And we can often get tunnel vision at that really peaks uh, extent of stress. Very physiological. So what we can do is use our breathing as a process to help us bring that stress response back down. In a, in a sense, your, well, your, your stress response is controlled by the same mechanism as your breathing, the autonomic nervous system, which in a sense talks about everything that's automatic, the things you don't have to think about. You don't have to think about breathing, you don't have to think about stressing out, you don't have to think about your blood pumping around, your heart going, those kinds of things, because it's all controlled by the autonomic nervous system. So what we can do with that is use our breathing to rein back in that stress response. As the stress response is going up towards overwhelm, we can employ breathing as a technique. Not just any old breathing, but slow, deliberate, lower abdomen type breathing. Because often when we're stressed, we'll breathe thoracically more up here. <laughs> that kind of thing. <clears throat> and I've automatically just raised my stress response by doing that. But if we can just drop our shoulders, just try to focus on moving our breathing down, either whole chest or preferably lower chest. But don't worry too much. It's more about the slow, deliberate process. And here's my little tool, the rest of your breath. 224. I'm not going to demonstrate it here. I will link some resources where you can get some audios, if you can stand and listen to me after this session uh, anymore, uh, where I do a two minute, five minute, ten minute rescue breath process. But you can practice this and I would suggest you practice it when it's not critical so that when you have the time, the critical time, you've got it well practiced. There are lots of different techniques, but this is mine. It's breathe in for two, nice and slowly focusing on the breathing and the counting. Hold your breath for two, Nice and slowly, focusing on the breathing and the counting. And then nice and slowly breathe out for four. Focusing on the breathing and the counting. Now don't worry if you do practice it, if you decide to pause it and have a practice now or try it later. Don't worry if you struggle to maintain the count of four on the way out. Often we're so habitually used to breathing fast and shallow that it can take practice. So do two, two, two and a little bit longer, or two, two, three, or one, one, two. Just shorten it, but slow things down as best you can. Because the, act, the, the active action of focusing on the counting, the breathing and the slowing down can help detach your mind from the thing that stressed you out. So you might have removed from heat, but you've also removed yourself psychologically as well. Really powerful tool. And if you repeat this a couple of times, nice and slow, you can really bring that emotional temperature down and help you get your, your, your rational part of your brain engaged. This is where the next tip comes in because we it's important that we do this when we've had that chance to bring the emotional temperature down and this is to recognize that in times of overwhelm we tend to overreact have you overreacted when you've been in overwhelm i'm sure you have we all do permission to be human the point is that's the stress response kicking in and what we need to do is use those techniques remove from heat and rescue breath to bring us back down let the rational come in and then use a question to help us get perspective to let the rational kick back in. So the question that I'm going to give you might sound a bit silly, but it's it's a useful little uh, question. And it's something that hopefully because it's silly, it might hook into your memory. Because I'm confident that you know what to do. Many of us know, we've picked up tools and tactics along the way. It's doing it when it counts, isn't it? Because we're often too stressed to remember these things. So we've got a memory hook, like the question I'm going to give you. It might bring a little smile to your face and it might help you get that perspective back. So remove from heat, rescue breath, Ask yourself, right, is what stressed me out? Is that thing that's just stressed me out? Is it cabbage or is it sprout? Now bear with me, because I'm holding a cabbage and a sprout, I get that. But what am I asking myself here? I'm asking myself, is what's just stressed me out big or little? Because here's the reality, sometimes it's big. And if it's big, give the cabbage the cabbage size attention it deserves. But if it's little, and how often is it little? Then we need to recognise it's a sprout and don't sweat that sprout. That's the key. Don't sweat this sprout because this is the thing. Your brain doesn't like to deal with the cabbages. And what it will do is just carry the cabbages around in our heads all of the time. It will do that to just cope. And how good are you at doing that? And I'm not saying this is a great thing, but this is what we do. We cope and cope and cope. And then it only takes one sprout size thing to tip us over, doesn't it? One little thing, one word, one, oh, have you got two minutes, could you just, or something you've thought about in your head and you've tipped over and the sprout gets it. And this is where that cabbage or sprout question is really useful. 
but then the phrase don't sweat that sprout remind yourself don't sweat that sprout because whilst you're sweating that sprout because your brain can handle that under stress you've got cabbages getting smelly and rotten haven't you and they're harder to cope with the hot the smellier they get so that's a key tactic so have a think about that when could you use that don't sweat the, the cabbage or sprout question <clears throat> and then take a time out now you can take 60 seconds or longer if you wish but what tends to trigger overwhelming you and how could you use these tactics how could you use them next time how could you remember them what would help you remember them in the key moment so what are the triggers and what would help you i'll give you 60 seconds I'll come back to what we do with the cabbages shortly because that's the overload. But what we need to think about now is the, because we're still on perspective, that's a short term perspective. That's that get the emotions down, the rational in so we can get a bit of perspective to get our heads back in the game. But then there's the medium term perspective. And that is, well, I guess it is dealing with the cabbages in a way. It's kind of recognizing that what we tend to do under stress is we can fo it's tend to focus on everything you can't do everything that's not possible that I'm stuck with that I have no power over and we take our eyes and our focus off what we actually can do even if it's one small thing and that's where this high demand low control part the the high demand low control low social support model comes in because it's not just about dealing with the cabbages and the challenges it's about giving ourselves a sense of control and sometimes when we focus on the things we can't do we end up losing sight of the small thing we can do, which if we did or focused on, would give us a sense of control. So what I want to talk about here is the zones of influence and concern. Some of you may have come across this. Um, it's It's been referenced in for um, way back, but Stephen Corby in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, identified this as a really useful tool. He talks about it as a big circle, if you like. We have a lot we can be concerned about, and that's what we tend to focus on when we're under stress, I've got this, I've got that, so many cabbages to deal with. And then we reckon, we fail to recognize that there is a, something we can influence. And that is small. And when we're focused on the concerns, that small bit we can do something about becomes minimal or meaningless. We focus on everything we can't do. And the trick is here, or the trick is a tactic and a practice, is to recognize that when your head is in what I can't do, we can shift it to what you can do. We may be naturally pessimistic. I would say I'm a naturally pessimistic person. I tend to focus towards a negative when under stress. But that doesn't mean to say I can't then, when I recognise that I'm in the can't, that I can't adopt an optimistic thinking style and rest my attention on what I can. It takes practice, but what we're talking about is shifting our focus away from the concerns onto what we can influence and then expanding that. Because what inevitably happens is when we start to focus on what I can do, we start identifying one sprout size thing. Well, I can at least do that. I might speak to somebody about that or I'll just do that one thing. I'll make that phone call or send that text or email. We then find something else. And if we focus on what we can do, that circle of influence expands. It doesn't take over the whole circle because there are naturally things that are completely out of your control. You can't control the political landscape or the global landscape or even things within the university or your association that might be affected by policy, procedure, legislation, that kind of thing. We have to focus on what we can influence. And the thing is, when your brain can move away from that onto the small sprout sized things it can deal with, then it has the chance to sweat these sprouts and to feel a better sense of control. So it helps us shift perspective in the medium term. So on activity, what do you tend to find yourself worrying about? And what aspects can you influence or control? 
what is out of your control. And do the exercise with some past examples or even some current examples to help see how this can be useful in help you focusing. And also to recognise that your brain will always keep wanting to go back to what it can't do. Yeah, but I can't do that. I can't. Bring it back. Bring it back to the sprout you can sweat that mean you can do things. Now we're going to look at the long-term perspective and I'm going to give you a little technique that can be useful but in effect what we're talking about here is recognise short-term is in the moment and sometimes we can de be deviated from rational thinking by our emotions and by stress. In the medium term we can be ground down and distracted by what we can't do rather than what we can do. And in the long term this is about something about having a long term, having a long-term vision into which we can place the goals and things we're working on now. What's the direction of travel for our life? Nothing fixed and firm necessarily because we don't know a lot that's going to happen in the future, but having a rough direction of travel. What kind of life would I like to live? What, are, what would be a great few years? What would be successful next three years, for example? But at the same time, it's also then in this exercise, it's kind of thinking, well, this is a lifelong process and it's a work in progress all the way. And if you were to be just project yourself now to sitting in that rocking chair, uh, you've got a little blanket across your lap and you're kind of thinking about your life, you're looking back. And if you were, if you think about some of the challenging times that you, you're going through now or have gone through, and then project yourself into the future, into that rocking chair moment and kind of think back and say, what would that person, that future you, tell you now about that? What would they tell you to worry about less, to focus on doing more? and to, to work towards what would matter to that person, that future you, sitting in that rocking chair in the future. God willing we get there, but you know, that, that's, uh, that's another matter. So what would be the, the advice that person would give you? And that's a useful little exercise just to ground you in, ground what you're doing now, which can feel all consuming and, and like it's the be all and end all, into actually in the scheme of life, in the direction of life, it could be, it could be a blip. It could be a challenge you'll get through, you'll learn, you'll grow. It could be painful, but, and the advice from that person, that future you, can be useful in just helping set your perspective from there. Yes, it's a mind game, if you like, but it can be really useful to do that. Okay. So the next one is to look at connections. And what we're talking about is that network and that psychosocial support, but the connections to help you fulfil your purpose as a team, etc. <clears throat> and what I want to do is talk about four key connection areas if you like this is particularly focused in well-being but i think it's relevant in a lot of areas of our life we have in uh, like area one if you like is our close and intimate relationships now some of us may have quite a wide three four five of really close people people that you are totally open with that you bear your soul to that there's no secrets between them there's always something we hold back from everybody but they are people that know you intimately and you know them it could be a partner it could be a parent be a sibling, a, a really, really close friend or soulmate. But it's a re recognising that the importance of that. And sometimes we don't have somebody in that particular network. And that is not a, uh, a, a game changer or killer of the game. It's actually just rec important to recognise that actually that is something that's important for many of us to have that. So we have that net that aspect of the network we then have our wider circle of close family and friends and the point of this is they may not know you as intimately as that close person but they've got your back you've shared moments and memories and you know that you can go to them for support and they can come to you for support and it's lovely to catch up with them from time to time um you know at events and, and family events maybe um uh you know a visit with a concert for a favorite band or some a group or something like that 
Then you have your wider network, and these might be people that you've more recently met, um, they might be the team members, um, there may be people that you like, some you're not quite keen on, but they remind you you're human and that you exist because they're around you, they connect with you, you engage with them in different ways, and they're part of the rituals and routines of your day-to-day -day life. Really important. And then your fourth one is the bit that perhaps we sometimes forget. It's your professional independent support. It's that accessing the um, the support through the Student Leadership Academy or through your college within the university or your GP, professional counsellor. It's the thing that we need when we're struggling. And perhaps we can't go to a close friend because they've got some investment in you. You, you need somebody who's detached to just talk through or an expert to help you kind of work through some of the issues. Those four are really, really important in terms of our network. And permission to be human, depending on where we're at in terms of our journey of life, we may have gaps and that's okay, but that's about acknowledging that and permission to be human. We may then find coping with the challenges of life and our resilience just a little bit less robust. And again, that's okay, but it's about what can we do to bolster and boost the, the, the network that we have. And if one particular net area of this, one, two, three, or four, isn't as available or present, how can we lean on or leverage the other areas to help sort of support and make, make up for that? So complete the activity in the workbook and identify who is in your support network. It's actually really worthwhile because sometimes articulating the name of Dallin Paper can help you remind you and refresh, you know what, they are a really good friend, I haven't been in touch with them for a while, that kind of thing. And if you're not, particularly with connection box four, professional independent support, if you're not that clear on what that is, that's a flag to say, I need to find out because it's really, really important, not just for you, but also it's worth having a working knowledge of that in if you're supporting a member of your team. So we're talking about emotional intelligence as a fourth part of this mix. Again, as I said, I'm not going to go into this as a, a teaching itself because this may be something that you think, you know what, I would like to learn more. Let's tap into some of the other resources. There may be some self-teachers around this uh, and there may be some other ways to learn. There's certainly some books. Daniel Goldman is the author and kind of creator of the concept of emotional intelligence and has produced some great resources and books on that. So that can be really useful. But what we're talking about in terms of emotional intelligence are two aspects. There's the intrapersonal and interpersonal. Intra means internal. It's kind of the, the, the internal workings and being aware of our inner, inner workings, if you like. I'm not talking about physically, I'm talking about psychologically. So there is about self-awareness. Being aware of your own strengths, your own propensities and personality traits, and then managing yourself. So go back to the overwhelm exercise you know, understanding what triggers you into overwhelm is an exercise in self-awareness, increasing self-awareness. Being aware of your triggers and then having tools in the kit like the rescue breath, the remove from heat, is self-management. It's about adding to the toolkit to help you become more effective at that so that you are more healthy, you're less damaging to yourself in the process, and also you can engage with the world, which is where the interpersonal comes in. Because the interpersonal is about two aspects again. It's about empathy. It's about that understanding that other people see the world differently. But we can connect on shared shared emotions or at least appreciation that they're going through a tough time. Or I can see that they're struggling. So I can tell that they're upset. Or I can almost feel that they're upset because I can see that that experience might be challenging for them. So empathy can be a really useful um aspect to, to explore and if you look at the listening skills module I do dig a little bit deeper into that not too deep because it can take a lot there's a whole world of work around empathy but enough to help you understand it and to utilize it as a as something that can be more empathetic towards yourself as well as others and then managing relationships how do we manage our interactions and our connections and connect with each other again that's down to things like the well-being conversations which module which you'll find things like the mediation and the conflict resolution self-teach modules which can be useful and listening skills again so there's a bunch of modules that can help you with that one so here's the thing what area of emotional intelligence do you feel you have strengths in and what do you need developing so take some time have a look at that and then come back
Okay, so physical energy. And what we're talking about here is how do we take care of the whole vessel, if you like, this whole vessel. Your body is more than just a vehicle for getting your brain around to class meetings, that kind of thing. We need to recognise that it is a wonderful, wonderful creation and we need to recognise that it needs a bit of care. So if you imagine, if you recall back to the video with Rosie and the cuddly toys, the cuddly toys are getting crushed. The cuddly toys represent self-care. And what I want to do is introduce you, by way of a metaphor again, six areas of self-care that I think can help support your caring for your physical energy, but also look after your psychological and emotional well-being as well. And I'm going to introduce the radish. Now, the radish, now, bear with me, just think of yourself, do you like radish? Or do you not like radish? Chances are, well, you'll have an opinion one way or the other, I guess. Sometimes you might be in the middle. But when I do this in class, I find that there's inevitably some people really like radish, some people don't. But here's the reality. You know, this little radish is trying its hardest to be the spiciest little radish in the whole wide world. But there's always somebody who doesn't like radish. And this is the thing. Isn't that like us? How many of you, and how many members potentially of your team are like this, driving themselves to be all things to everyone, to be perfect at everything? Perfect doesn't exist. Better is something we can work towards, but without grinding ourselves down. And this is the question, because sometimes we can grind ourselves too far. And in the process, our little inner radish, metaphorical, I get it, we don't have a real radish, but let's go with it, needs some TLC, needs some self-care. So I'm going to give you six areas to self-care and the happy radish. And it forms a mnemonic, a radish as well, R-A-D-I-S-H. And I've got some links and resources to support this as well. So the first one is the R. Now, this is a little picture of Rosie when she was three months old, a lot younger, but I get, bet you can tell that Rosie's young, but I'm not. I'm no spring chicken, am I? No comments, please. But I am. I was 45 when Rosie was born. And what I found was, I've got two older kids, Hannah and Thomas, uh, 27 and 24. And when I was younger, it was challenging to have kids. You know, it, they drain the batteries. Um, but so do demands in life. If you're juggling lots of cabbages, lots of demands, you'll find your batteries drain. As I got older, I found the batteries drain quicker. But the more demands and challenges we juggle, the quicker our emotional, physical and psychological batteries drain. So one of the things we need to recognise is, yes, we've got the cabbages to deal with. We need to deal with them, and I'll come on to a little bit, a few more tactics after this part of the, you know, after the self-care. But we also need to recognise we need to recharge the batteries and focus on downtime, but genuine recharging of the batteries. So yes, we can let our hair down, have a, have a great time, perhaps have a, go out for a few drinks, etc. if that's your thing. But we also need to know that we need to quality recharge. So we need to look at our sleep and how we can improve that. And I've got some links to some, some courses that can support that, an audio course, etc. that will help you with that. We also need to re recognise that taking quality breaks, distraction free, putting the phone aside, getting our hair clear and going for a walk or having 10 minutes out can be really useful just to help you take those mini breaks during the time and relearn how to relax. The second one is, I guess the first question is, would you agree that if you finish the day living and breathing, there's more gone right than wrong? Now, some of you may be thinking, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah I get that. Or some of you may think, well, I'm not sure. Don't get me wrong, I know there are days that will challenge this. But what I don't want to do, and I don't want to minimise that, but what I do want to do is focus our attention on the fact that we as human beings tend to dwell on the negative. As I said, we focus on what we can't do, but we also focus on the negative, the painful experiences. That's part of the survival strategy we've evolved because it helps us learn and not go back there to avoid or to deal with those things in the future. However, when we're dwelling on that, what we forget is that there's more gone right than wrong. And we don't pay attention to the good stuff. So a little practice called appreciation practice is really useful to help tune your brain back into the things that have gone right and to help move our attention away from the things that have gone wrong. Now, I'm not saying we don't deal with the cabbages or at least we don't get them out of our head and onto some paper, to-do list, etc. for later. But we spend some time to just appreciate the positive things. So a little tactic. On a morning when you wake up, just brushing your teeth perhaps, think about, right, today I want to find three things I can really appreciate. Think three things. It doesn't have to be big things. Three different things today that I can be appreciative of, thankful for, that have gone right. And then at the end of my day, when I've dumped my cabbages and I'm kind of just trying to unwind, I'm going to take do a conscious practice of thinking about those three things and acknowledge and appreciate them. Because that process helps you unhook from the negative and hook into the positive sprouts. And in that process, it gives your brain a finding chance to start to unhook and unwind and settle down. So if you find yourself really fighting and finding it difficult to switch off, techniques and practices like that can be really useful. 
day is for day time and i'm not just talking about romantic times etc i'm talking about time for you where you just take yourself off you park the to-do list you park all your student work your student leadership work and you have 10 minutes or so and this is my challenge if you struggle to do this you might be able to take longer but if you struggle to have time is take 10 minutes a day commit to 10 minutes a day where you have time for yourself park all the agendas in the to-do list and you do something you really enjoy that really is refreshing and rewarding or whatever that helps you lose yourself decompress and you can encourage your team members to do this as well because some of them may be particularly driven and not feel the value in just taking a break the I is about injecting some inspiration and recognise that sometimes we just lose our spark and the self-talk, the positive self-talk, isn't going to cut it. And at those times, what we need to recognise is we can use things that help shift our mood. And I don't mean things like drugs or alcohol. I mean, that's part of those, I mean things like a favourite piece of music that can shift your mood. Uh, a poem, a prayer, or a person, or a place. You know, go to that place that makes you feel <sighs> great. And my little tip here is, and most of us have probably got a smartphone with a bunch of photographs on there. Um, take some time to skim through it and favourite 10 photographs. And my tip here is, or my requirement is, that those 10 photographs have got to be meaningful to you in a way that make you, when you look at them, you go, oh, remember that? Oh, man, that was brilliant. Love that. And it brings some warmth and smile and changes your mood. Because when you are in a low place, what you then have is 10 favourite photographs that you can take yourself off and have a look through and shift your emotional state. Now, you might have cabbages to deal with. Let's not ignore those. We deal with them. But what we need to do is get our state into something a little bit more positive so that, A, we can make the best choice. It might be some more self-care or it might be, right, I'm ready. I can get back to that. I can focus on something I can do, not I can't do. Yes, it's a sweat, which is just move, have fun, get out there. Get outside and move more. We've evolved to be outside in the fresh air and moving more than we have sitting inside these things called boxes, which are rooms, libraries, you know, offices, that kind of thing. And the H is really why I deliver some of these sessions, this one in particular, using things like metaphors and silly things like that, is because way back when I, my son Thomas was four year old, he um, stomped into the kitchen as kids do, uh, to his mum and said, oh mum, dad's in a bad mood again, isn't he? And I remember sitting in the living room thinking, oh, a poor lad, you know, four year old and I'm in a bad mood again. But I wasn't just in a bad mood again. I'd been in a bad mood his entire life. And what Thomas had come to experience was a grumpy, distracted, sour-faced, serious dad. And I realised, you know what? I'm taking it all too seriously. And one of the things I forgot to do was have some fun. And when I talk about having fun, I mean, the things that really do it for you, what it might be reading a good book, or it might be having a dance or a sing or something, whatever it is, but it's remembering that not to postpone your fun until you achieve this, you finish that, you get that done, you complete this, you get that job, you get that, you retire. Because when we do that, we forget that right now, here in this moment, there's more going right than wrong. And it's worth having those moments of fun. So that's my six areas of self-care. Recharge the batteries, appreciation, daytime, inject some inspiration, sweat and have fun. Which one will you choose? Which one would you pick? And how can you encourage good self-care within your team? So take some time out to think about that and uh, we'll come back to it after this. So just to wrap things up, I want to talk about overload because this is the underlying issue. So we, we need sometimes just to take time for self-care. We need sometimes to recognise that we manage overwhelm. And some of those other things like our connections and, and um, purpose, value, stress are all important. But what we also need to do is recognise that the cabbages 
need to get dealt with. And under stress, your brain doesn't want to do that. It would rather go off at this sprout rather than that cabbage. So how do we deal with the overload? And in effect, it comes down to help playing to the brain's strengths when under stress. Because if your brain doesn't like cabbages, but it does like sprouts, what we need to do is sweat the right sprouts. And what I mean by that is we take the cabbage and we slice it down and chunk it down into sprout sized chunks into chunks that are small enough actions to help you move forward and progress, feel a sense of control and sweat the sprout so you're making progress. Because your brain is going, oh, I can't handle that, I can't handle that. But if you give it one small thing to do, it can handle it under stress. So how do we do that? Well, we slice and dice. How do you do that? I'm sure you do it already. You kind of break things up, you kind of recognize, I've got this essay, I've this research project, I've got this piece of work to do within the Leadership Academy, and I've got to sort this out personally. We identify our cabbages, the demands that we have in life, and we slice, we pick the smelliest, the one you least want to deal with, the one that you're procrastinating the most, and slice that down into a to-do list, and kind of break it up, and then sweat the sprouts. So, before I kind of give you a couple of tips, Take a break and, what, and pause the video. What do you think you can do or what do you already do that helps you break down the cabbages and the challenges and the things you've got to do into manageable chunks? What do you already do? Jot a few thoughts down and then we'll come back. Okay, so slicing and dicing. Key principles here are, one, get it out of your head. Your brain is a rubbish cabbage storage device. In fact, it struggles to cope with juggling all of these things so that that's why you appear distracted, unable to focus, make decisions and prone to overwhelm. So get it out of your head into a reliable cabbage storage device. You'll find my time management session will expand on that particular aspect. But get it out onto something reliable so your brain will go, right, okay, at least it's out there. I can free my brain up and do what it's good at. The if this, then that tool, now, this I've found over the last 18 months, particularly during restrictions lockdown, when I've worked with a lot of clients, is really useful in helping you confront the what-if worries. I don't know about you, but many of us have those. How many of you have got, you worry, you tend to find yourself preoccupied with worries, and a lot of those are what if, what if this happens, or what if I don't do this, what if I can't get that, what if this comes back and bites me, what if, what if, what if, and what we tend to do is push those what if cabbages, the worries, to the back of our mind and kind of try to ignore them, but all that happen in, happens is we unconsciously continue to worry, or subconsciously continue to worry, we know we're doing it, we're trying to get on with life and all that does is drain the battery so what i find really useful is to to confront the worries to get that what if cabbage identify them and deal with one at a time spend some time constructively consciously worrying about that cabbage now that sounds negative what i mean is we say right okay so that's what i'm worried about what if this happens okay what if it happens if this happens then that is what i'll do if this then that so we think about the cabbage right if that happens then I'm going to identify three action points of things, three sprout size actions that I will do. So it might be a financial worry. If this happens, then I will do A, B and C. I'll speak to my student leadership support. I will speak to, I will then contact and we will identify some actions. Because that process of identifying the cabbage, if this happens, then that, identifying the actions is what I'll do. We give our brain that sense of, we've got this, I don't want it to happen, but if it does, I've got some action to take. And that can help alleviate that sense of worry. Because worrying itself is not the problem. Worrying gets a bad rap. The worry that is the problem and can be really crippling is when we push at the back of mind and try not to avoid or ignore it. Actually constructively worrying, sometimes we need a bit of support here because if it's particularly huge, 
as a as a as a worry we may need some support from a friend or a counselor or therapist but that process can be really really powerful in helping you chug it down and get it off your mind we need to think about our work rest and play zones and airlocks and this is important because what we're talking about here is recognizing that work rest and play can all blur in if you're doing some work on your laptop for example on the couch or you know you, you're kind of blurring the zones in your in your room or your 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 house or you know you're kind of mixing and matching you're doing work and rest you're kind of looking at the phone and all kinds of social media mixing in with work we're kind of creating a confusion for our brain your brain can't juggle what it needs is clear thing clear space so where is your workspace it could be a corner of a table in the kitchen or a corner of a, a particular chair in the living room if you've got a smaller room where is your rest space and keep work out of it where do you play and how can you just keep yourself distraction free from work and how can you keep the spaces clear so that you know that's for work that's for rest that's for play work rest and play is an oversimplification there's different zones but keep the signals differently and then create airlocks between so if you move from work you know you finish some student work perhaps you don't go straight into another activity and find that you're physically in the other activity but your head is still back here doing the work in your head what you need is a little bit of an airlock and that might be a bit of a stand up stretch it might be 30 seconds it might be go for a quick walk it might be just something that allows your brain to catch up it might be take a piece of paper and jot down everything you need to do next time you pick this piece of work up empty your head that can be really useful and then check out the time management self teach because that could be a really useful tool to help you kind of pull things some of these practical aspects of managing overload together in terms of procrastination is one area i mentioned it before but if you find you're putting off things then one of the things is all of these tactics is to recognize what you're putting off. What is the thing you're putting off most? That's the thing you need to do next. And it's to pick one thing. What's one sprout size thing I need to do in order to make a start on this or to continue? Don't set yourself the target of doing it all. It could be, right, I don't even know what the next thing is to do. Do you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do five minutes working out what the next thing to do is. Procrastination is beaten in sprout sized actions or chunks. So do one thing only. And then deal with things sprout by sprout, because it's all sprouts. If we give ourselves the chance to chunk the cabbages down, sprout by sprout, it's all sprouts. Okay, so, covered a lot. So, in terms of action, go to the workbook and look at the action planning there. But what tool or strategy could you develop for your own personal resilience? What of the five areas of resilience can you focus on improving your team resilience? Don't try to do it all at once. We can do it over time. Pick one to focus on. And then how can you support the individuals uh, and the team as a whole uh, in developing their own resilience? What do you need to do, implement or to do to support them? Okay, so we've covered a lot, as I said, we looked at understanding stress and strain, that high demand, low control, low social support model and the video with Rosie and the cabbages. We've looked at knowing your warning signs was a key important part of getting thing, getting started with doing something about our stress and strain. We looked at what are the five areas of resilience which can be really useful, and particularly in focusing down act, action on uh, developing the resilience of our team. How do we cope with overwhelm in the moment, that rescue breath, the remove from heat. Six areas of self-care, which I went through, the radish, remember the radish? And dealing with overload, some practical tips there, and again, tie in with the time management module as well. So hopefully that's been useful for you, checking on the other activities um, in the workbook, revisit them over time, revisit them with your team and check out the other self-teach modules. But for now, take care.